Welcome to The Neutral Ground. We've all heard about the importance of reading to children, especially when they're young. Oftentimes, this is in connection with their educational maturation. However, I want to speak briefly about the importance of reading to children and helping them become thoughtful, meaningful adults. Our guest this week on the show is children's author and owner of J.J. Carson Press, Ashley Finley. I came across one of Ashley's books as I was looking for a gift for my goddaughter, and it was the title of her second book that really caught my attention, No Limits, a story celebrating the unconditional love of a father. So many times today when we hear about fathers, it's in a negative light. However, Ashley's book celebrates the complexity, the struggle, and most importantly, the unconditional love that a father can bring to his children. Then, I read Ashley's first book, Jade's Secret Ingredients, and I was taken aback by what she is attempting to inculcate in children. Calmness, gratitude, reflection, patience. These are all things that we need as adults. I knew that I wanted to have her on the show because her books are challenging young people in a complicated way, in a way that other books being published today for children either do not or dare not. There are links in the episode notes to Ashley's works and her company, J.J. Carson Press. I encourage anyone with young ones in their lives to purchase the books and check out her works. If you appreciate the conversation, let me know by subscribing to the show, leaving a kind comment or rating where applicable, and sharing the episode with a friend. You can also follow me on social media for some additional information about the show, inspiring quotations, and my Change Your Algorithm song recommendations. If you don't know what that is, go check it out. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Ashley Finley. Ashley, welcome to The Neutral Ground. How are you doing today? I am absolutely awesome. How are you? I'm fantastic. Yeah, I love this. I love this topic. I love thinking about children's literature and and how we're getting complex messages to them in a way that they can understand and yet kind of, you know, grapple with more than anything. And I'm particularly excited about having you on because you have a lot going on, actually. You're the author of two wonderful children's books, which we're going to talk about in this episode. And you, you even founded your own publishing house, J.J. Carson Press. And you're also a mental health advocate. So we have plenty to talk about today. But I actually want to start by just asking you a little bit of, can you narrate for us kind of your, your story about how you arrived at these ventures? Absolutely. So this is, of course, my life's journey, right? It's so interesting um, where we think we're going to go as children and kind of where life life takes us to as adults. So um, as a kid, I was always, always, always someone who was not interested in reading, okay? Um, I had issues relating to the characters and the books that I was reading. I just thought that, okay, everybody has their thing and reading was not mine. So um, I kind of ventured into other things as a child, had other interests. And as I got older, um, I realized that it wasn't that I didn't like to read. It was more, um, I didn't connect well with the characters. And so when I realized that it was like, "Ah, for me, And um, I've always been someone who has wanted to help others. I always found great joy in working with children and senior citizens, uh, even as a child and as I got older. And so I kind of took that and um, I decided that I was going to be a teacher. And so I went to school with that as my original major. And then I was introduced to the wonderful world of social work. And so um, as I dive more into that, I found that social work is a very versatile uh, field. And so um, I figured out that I could get my degree and um, my educational background in social work while still serving others 
and uh, teach as well. And so that is the route that I chose. I completed my bachelor's in social work at the University of Texas at Arlington, go Mavs. And I completed my master's in clinical social work at Bear University down in the 305, that's Miami, Florida. And so I have been working with children, doing mental health therapy. I have um, also become a, a certified teacher along the way. So I taught children as well. And it was, I believe it was after the birth of my first child that I realized, hey, there's a gap in this children's literature market. Like there is an opportunity that needs to be filled as far as the books that I want my son to read and the books that I'm finding. And that's what I was reminded of my challenges with reading and my um, how I connected to it at an, old, an elder age. And when I realized, oh, I can help fill that gap. I can use all of these experiences that I've had with children, with teaching, with um, the things that I've learned in my own mental health journey. And I can use that information and package it in a way that children like mine can receive it. And I can challenge those barriers that I had of not seeing characters who look like me, not having characters that I felt like I could really relate to. And I could um, use all of my life experience and put it into this beautiful package of a children's book. And so that is what I did with my first book, Jade Secret Ingredients, a recipe for managing feelings. It has the social work, uh, mental health aspect. It has representation for uh, children to be able to connect with, for Black children. And it just is a fun, loving story. And that's kind of where I am today. I also have my other book, No Limits, a story celebrating the unconditional love of a father, which pays homage to all of the amazing fathers out there and um, which was inspired by my own husband and his relationship with our two boys. So that's where I am now. I did launch my own publishing house in the process. I am a mommypreneur. I am a wife. I am someone who is passionate about the mental wellness of myself, my children and everyone else. So that's me, that's Ashley Finley. Yeah, you touched upon a, a lot of what we're going to be talking about here. And, and I'd like to ask you about something you mentioned there, too. You said the social worker is a very versatile kind of figure. And what I find to be interesting about that is social work has somehow become just this like con like a container. And and we we tend to not think about the versatility of of skills that you have to have to be able to really help children. And not only that, but it is a calling. I mean, it, you don't, because I have students you know, in college who want to go into social work. And one of the things that we talk about is this idea of you have to really, you have to have a calling for it or you get burned out so quickly. I've known people who have been burned out on it because it, it pulls a lot out of you. It's very emotional and, and you, you love the children. And that alone pulls a lot of emotion. Can I ask you to speak a little bit about, about the job of a social worker, just to give maybe a little bit of context for our discussion about the books even? Absolutely. So social work is something that I had no idea about as a child. I didn't know. I had never really came in contact with the social worker that I can remember. So I didn't have a face or a figure to kind of put um, to that name but I don't remember exactly how I was introduced to it, um, but it was somewhere in college and I found out about it. And what really drew me to the profession is just how many different avenues you can take in the field. So it is one that you definitely want to make sure that you are dedicated to because you're going to face, regardless of what area you're in, being a social worker for the most part, you're, you're facing some type of barriers with your clients, whether you are a corporate social worker, a financial social worker, a school social worker, or a clinical social worker who does uh, mental health therapy and things like that. It is something that is very, it can be very draining and you have to figure out um, lots of things along the way, like boundaries and different things, because there are a million issues in the world that we, um, that we want to work on, right? But we can't do them all and you can't do them all day, 
every day. You are still a human being who, you know, has other things going on. And so with social work, I feel as though um, some people who aren't very uh, familiar with the profession, I always tell them, think about how you think about teachers, right? Especially in this pandemic kind of era that we're in, we're really recognizing the value, the dedication and the strength that it takes to be a teacher. And that is someone who is teaching content to someone else. And so in social work, you are doing that and more, right? especially depending on what, what, um, what area of social work you're in. So you definitely want to do your best to do your research, find it, what it is exactly that you're passionate about and research that. If you're passionate about children, research that, that area of children's social work and see, do you want to do mental health therapy? Do you want to be uh, work for the state, work for the school? What is it exactly? Um, what is the great the route that you want to take and what is it going to take from you to do that and what are you going to receive it's very important that we that we talk about salaries and lifestyles because that is something that sometimes i feel like in the beginning i was a little bit naive i was very passionate and just i want to save the world and i'm going to be a social worker and i'm not in it for that for the, uh, what was the thing we said? I'm not in it for the outcome. I'm in it for the, not the income. I'm in it for the outcome. I don't care about that money. It makes a difference. Let me tell you, it makes a difference in your lifestyle. And you just have to be ready. You don't want to be, um, you don't want to pass out when you see your salary offer for the position that you've worked so hard and you've gone to school to do. You want to already kind of have an understanding of this is what I want to do. This is what my life is going to look like. And I'm okay with that. Or I'm going to choose a different route. And there are different ways in, in social work to do that. But you definitely want to do your best and your due diligence to research those things ahead of time. That's fantastic advice for, for me to be able to talk to my students about. Uh, and it's funny. I never thought of it that way. I tell them similar advice when they say I'm a business major. I say, well... Okay, business is pretty broad, though. You want to start researching what aspects or areas of business you want to make your life. You know, what do you want to make your career? And uh, now I get to think about it that way, too, when they talk about social work. Do their research to think about which particular avenues they're more interested in. I, yeah, thank you for that. I hadn't really thought of it that way. Yes, I do. absolutely. It's something that, you know, if I could go back and tell my 20-year-old self when I was in that realm, you know, just the differences, because I felt as though social work in the beginning when I learned about it, I was like, it's versatile, but mm, I was still kind of surface level on my understanding. And I still, you know, there's clinical social work, which is mental health um, based kind of therapy one-on-one. -on -one. And then there's macro social work, which is the business side of social work, which is vastly similar, but however, it is also different salary wise, environment wise, what type of people you want to work with, all of those things. So it's just so important that we do our best to help our um the, the next generation of social workers, whether you're a young person or older person, you know, to have the knowledge to make the best decisions for their life. Because at the end of the day, um, the young people used to tell me, YOLO, Miss Finley, YOLO, you get one, you live, you only live once, right? So <laughs> you want to do your, your due diligence to try to um, create that life that you would love for yourself. Yeah, thank you for that. Well, I, I want to dive into, actually, I want to start with uh, with your book, No Limits, a story celebrating the unconditional love of a father. Now, let me ask this. So you are a mother of two wonderful, energetic young boys. Why not a book on motherhood? What spurred you to write a children's book about fatherhood? That's a great question. So... Um, no Limits is actually my second book. So my first book, it, it does feature a, a young girl and her grandmother. So that was my first, um, my first publication. And, and I, I like to think as authors, as artists, in a sense. And so when you think about an artist, typically, uh, whether it's someone who paints or someone who raps or someone who um, does pottery, 
typically artists are inspired. And that's how I operate in my gift. I am someone who is inspired by things. And then people always ask me, how long does it take you to write a book? Typically I can crank out the first draft in a day or two if I am inspired. And at that point in my life, um, watching the interaction of my husband with my sons is what gave me the inspiration for No Limits. Um, and so that's why I chose to go that route with my second book. Mothers are absolutely important, I'm telling you. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for a wonderful woman who carried us for 10 months, not nine, because it's 40 weeks, it's 10 months now. 10 months who, who carried and nurtured and took care of us. However, I wanted to speak to that strength and that vulnerability and that love that my husband had for our sons in this book. And also, there's also this, sometimes we, in the, in the media and in different places, there are stories amplified of fathers who don't necessarily have those characteristics. So I wanted to challenge that and share this narrative that many, many, many of us have with great Black fathers. And I wanted to honor my husband and all those wonderful fathers that I know in this book. And so that's why I choose to take this route. Well, one of the reasons why, because this was the first book, and, and we're going to talk about Jade as well, but this was the first book that I saw of yours. And when I saw the title, it spoke to me because, because of what you said. And then just as a side story, so I was watching something on, on TV, and there was a commercial for a reboot of The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. And I loved that show growing up. And immediately I became nostalgic and I went on YouTube and I was looking for clips. And do you know what the most watched clips are? The ones of the great, God rest his soul, James Avery as Uncle Phil, when he's yelling and chiding at the children, at Will Smith and, and Alfonso Ribeiro. And as someone who studies rhetoric for a living, I went right to the comments because I wanted to see what are they connecting with? And the comments were amazing. They ranged from uh, things like, I, all the way from, I wish Uncle Phil was my father, to things like, that's how it's done. This is what we need more of. We need that kind of loving ability to connect for a man, a father, to be able to connect with a child in a meaningful way. There's a kind of yearning for it. And that was, I think, part of what spoke to me when I saw, when I saw the title for this book. And then when I read it, this is going to connect now with your book. What I loved about it was you don't just focus on the positives, the positive interactions. In other words, the young man in the book, and this is a book made for young, for young people, but that doesn't mean it doesn't have depth. There, the young man in the book, he fails at a spelling bee. He crashes a car. These are things that happen in real life. We make mistakes. And the whole point is the father saying, I still love you. So it's a bit, in my opinion at least, for today, it was a bit daring of you to include mistakes and potential problems. Now, was that, can you speak a little bit to your mindset about that? Was that a conscious decision for you? Absolutely, it was. So um, what I love about being an author, and especially in this beautiful genre that I operate in, I have so much of myself, my life, my children's life, and my husband's life in those books. So I'm talking firsthand experiences. So um, many of those situations are things that have happened in my life. And I wanted to share what it would look like when you create this um, beautiful relationship of grace and acceptance and love, even when we go through life's journey and it's not as pretty as Instagram or Facebook or those different social media outlets makes it look sometimes because sometimes we get intimidated and there's this beautiful idea that I always remember, which is we connect through our struggles, not necessarily through our achievements. And so when I went, read the book to my sons, I wanted them to see, yes, daddy is there when you're born and you're so cute and you're quiet, but daddy is also there 
when you have him up in the middle of the night. Daddy is also there when you listen to what Dada says. And when you try something different, Daddy may not agree, but he's still there loving you and allowing you to grow into this beautiful human being that you were created to be. And so I was very, very purposeful of um, the words in the book. And I'm not an, an artist in the realm of an illustrator, but I have a wonderful illustrator who takes my ideas and my stick figures. And I'm very purposeful about everything from what they they wear to the type of car that they're crashing or the, the spaghetti that he's eating in the beginning. All of that is meaningful to me and it's very purposeful. And she takes that and creates it, um, creates a beautiful package for children to enjoy with that. But everything in the book I would say vast majority is purposeful. It is intentional. It is, um, it is, the book is created in a way so that children and adults can see the full realm of, as much as I can get into 32 pages, um, what fatherhood looks like, what beautiful, great, vulnerable, loving, strong fathers can look like. And so that's, that was what I wanted to do with this book. So absolutely, everything was purposeful. And you mentioned there, too, this idea for adults as well. And, and I was going to kind of go that route also a little bit here, which is it's not just a message for children, right? The point is adults reading to the children and feeling a sense of empowerment. Because, I mean, on this show, I tend to talk a lot about heroism, and the heroic narrative and how important that is. And toward the end of, let's say, maybe the last 15 years, we became very cynical in a lot of ways. And I remember hearing a conversation between two people, and they were just laughing about how, a common joke, the joke about parenthood and how it's not really an act of heroism. You know, congratulations, you, you made a child. And they kind of, you know, whisked it away. And I thought... That just makes me sad. Like that actually, no, I don't have a problem with, with looking at parenthood as a type of heroism. And this idea of you have to heed that call to raise a human being as best as you can and prepare them for a difficult world. And that is a heroic narrative. And so when I could picture where a parent reading that book would feel comforted and feel a sense of strength in knowing this is very purposeful, likely the most purposeful thing I'll ever do in my life. I should take it as an act of heroism. Am I reading too much into that? I think, um, so I'll be honest, for me, I'm not 100% familiar with the um, heroism, the narrative of it, but I will say my husband and I often talk about um, movies right? My husband's a big movie buff. And so we often talk about movies and how they are starting to change to where you have the hero and the villain. And then you start to realize that many times you're torn because you realize once you dig deep that they're similar because they're both, regardless of if you agree with all of their actions and things like that, they're both doing what they feel is right based on their experiences, whether or not, you know, you as the viewer agree, even in like a movie like Black Panther, where we look at, you know, Killmonger and you have, you know, Black Panther and we both look and it's like, mm, I can, I can connect with both of these individuals. I can see what he's got going on here and I can see how he's got this going on and they're taking their routes to try to um, get to this place that they want to be. I feel like that's kind of how parenting is sometimes. Um, and even on top of that, it's a, it's a on the job experience, you know. A lot, I we talked about when we were younger. Oh, you see kids, and you would say, "Oh, I would never do that." Oh, yeah, those. You have to show up every day, and sometimes what you thought you would never do, you say, "Okay, I got. I have a different understanding now. Maybe I will try that out a little differently." But I can see what they where they were coming from here. Um, so it, it is it is a, an act of heroism to me in a sense when you think about the intention that it takes um, to purposefully raise the best your child in the best environment with the best options and resources that you can. It, it is it is a job. 
It is a 24 hour a day, seven day a week, 365 days a year, 366 on your leap year. It is, <laughs> it is something, it's the hardest thing I've ever done, to be honest. I have master's degrees. I've gone to school and worked full time. I've done all those things. I Listen, parenthood is the most challenging thing that I have ever done, but it's also the most rewarding and the most heartfelt thing. And it is, it has brought me so much joy, but it is something that, that is work. It is absolute work. So in that sense of it, I would say we do show up and you do show up in it as a hero, so to speak, you know, being purposeful in, in the way that you parent. And, and that's, that's important. It's a very thoughtful book in a lot of ways with a, a wonderful message. And you had mentioned before that for some reason, media, and we can use that broadly, right? Media, not necessarily just news, but you know, even in movies and TV and all these different things, they tend to focus on these negative aspects of fatherhood. And I know there, there is no complete answer, but just to ask your opinion, why do you think that it does that? Why do you think that people are kind of, are, why do you think they're putting that message out there? Because I don't think it's helpful. Um, I, I, I think historically um, for Black fathers, there are um, things that, are, that have been systematically um, set up to challenge um, a certain narrative and to kind of uh, push another narrative. Um, I can speak for here in America uh, and in colonized places, um, but I'm not sure what the the grand scheme of things, what the the, the big plan is for um, why those stories tend to creep in or are systematically or purposely put in certain places. I I I don't. I don't put a lot of energy into that per se. I think what I feel as though is my calling is to share my personal experience and to challenge those things that I don't want my sons to spend their energy on and to kind of help them to realign and, and shift into the areas that I do want them to spend their um, energy on. I think sometimes our brains, you know, the way that they're wired for fight or flight, and especially those of us who've been through trauma, our um, brains kind of scan the environment and we look for things that are threatening. We look for things that are going to harm us. We look for things that are going to challenge our well being. But sometimes it takes a little bit of work to try to shift those things. And that's what I wanted to do in this book was to help parents and children shift that and say, yes, your dad may not be this, this, and this, or maybe your dad isn't around and you have this different father figure who um, has some challenges and things like that. But there are some wonderful things that are going on there as well. So although the things that aren't as great, they're important too and they matter, but we also want to try to have um, a positive viewpoint on some of the other things as well so that we're able to get a full picture and not kind of get stuck in this, um, this area where we are focusing on the deficits rather than the strengths. And maybe when you become a parent, you will have different strengths than your parents had and you can add on to that. And that's that idea of generational wealth that I am very passionate about which is, you know, having more than the generation before us and not having necessarily more stuff or more things, but more knowledge and more as it relates to mental wellness and um, rich relationships and self-care and all of those type of things. That's perfect. You're, you're speaking my language here. Just yesterday in the, in the classroom, we were talking about uh, algorithms on social media or digital platforms and how we're not always aware of what it's feeding us and how it's changing or altering the way that we think about ourselves and the way that we think about the world around us. And we did an experiment in the class 
to kind of say, to kind of see, could we feel a difference in viewing different forms of media? So I had one, we did one thing where we took an assessment of our baseline, how we felt, just a Likert scale of like one to 10, you know, one being terrible, 10 being great. And we had like a baseline of about six and a half to seven. Then I showed them this YouTube clip of like people yelling at each other, very loud, very uh, antagonistic. And I said, okay, let's look at that now and take note of how you feel. Do you feel a little bit, a little bit different? And the number went down just slightly from like maybe a six and a half and a seven to like a six or something like that or close. And then I showed them a clip of how wonderful we can be as human beings, helping each other, doing great feats, you know, to, for our, our, our fellow human being. And that had the greatest shift. That shifted roughly two points from like a six to an eight. And I said, okay, you tell me, what does that mean? Does it mean that you can, that you need to assert and, and put positive things in your path so that you can have some say in sculpting who you want to be in life? And so what you just said, this idea about you want your children to have that sense of agency, to say the negative is going to be there. You can't ignore it. But you also have some say in what you consume. And that plays a big role in the way that we feel about ourselves and the world around us. And so I absolutely appreciate what you just said. I 100% I agree. You, you have to be mindful of sometimes picking and choosing positivity. It is, it is very important that you're mindful about choosing, you know, as best you can, choosing what you consume. I like that you said that. That's so important. I am someone who loves to eat desserts. I have always had a sweet tooth. I always joke and tell people, all my teeth are sweet because I love cakes, cookies, pies. It's kind of how we got Jade's Secret Ingredients because <laughs> there's a little bit of me in there because I love desserts. I love them. They're yummy. They're delicious. They, they get my dopamine going. I feel great. But I also have to be mindful of I can't consume them all the time. As wonderful as they are, as happy as they make me feel sometimes, it's nostalgic thinking of baking with my grandmother. Oh, it's great. But I have to be mindful that to be my best self, I cannot consume them all day long. And it is a struggle sometimes because I want to. <laughs> it feels good. It's kind of, for whatever reason, it feels natural to me, like cake, cake, cake all day long. But you have to be mindful about what you are consuming. And on social media, it's, it's so, so important because it does affect your mood, what you look at. We know that. We know when we watch videos of, of kittens and puppies and all our babies, and then, we, oh, it just changes your whole mood. Versus if you're watching something that is intense or possibly more violent or what have you, but you have to find that balance for yourself, whether it's who you're following on social media. There's a point in my life, and I still do this, where I look at people I'm following and it is very fluid because I follow this person for whatever reason and I may feel like that no longer serves me right now. It doesn't take me to the place that I want it to go. So now I'm going to go ahead. This is my safe space that I've created and I have the right to disconnect from that person if I feel like I need to do so. Or I, I monitor myself, that self-regulation, that checking in with myself. Mm, I've been looking at a lot of videos. There are a lot of intense things because I'm someone who likes to dive into challenges and see how I can help. And sometimes that, that can be challenging when you're a teacher or a social worker because you always want to help somebody. But you have to check in with yourself and say, oh, I've been doing that a lot lately. I've been feeling tension in my body. I'm not sleeping well. I need to relax today. I'm just going to go and find me a feel good movie or I'm going to go and read this type of book that I enjoy. I'm going to go and do this activity to give myself a chance to relax and recharge and to pour back into me. And then I can go back and challenge those problems because there are many problems in the world. There are many issues and there are many challenges, but you have to find that balance for yourself. And I think that's what, what you were talking about earlier when you talk about burnout. 
I feel like it's when we're just like, we're going from thing to thing to thing and we don't stop and check back in with ourselves. And so I think the experiment that you did with your students shown, and it's so important to see that, yes, what we see affects us. Of course it does. Of course it does. And we have the power to change that. Even if you're on social media with certain algorithms, you can still go to the search bar and search what you want to search and click on that page. Maybe the algorithm is filtering you certain things, but there are many times when I go on Instagram and I look at my feed and I think, okay, I'm not into this feed. I feel like seeing such and such today. Let me just type in their name and see what they're talking about. Or I feel like seeing this kind of video. And sometimes I feel like, oh, I haven't seen this and I see this kind of crazy stuff going on. Okay, I'm going to go create this kind of post and I'm going to put it out there because I feel like this is what I need and other people may benefit it benefit from it right now as well. Yes, that that's again perfect and and something that I do on on social media is I like once a week I'll do a post of I say change your algorithm change your life and it's just a post that that you know has a song uh for it just for people to go check out a song you know whether it's something from the drifters or something just something beautiful because music has that wonderful way of connecting with us so much more easily and quickly and and so the idea is just every so often force feed the algorithm something positive, something that can remind you that you are a part of, of humanity again, because it's just so easy today to just let it, the algorithm continually feed you and, and kind of, again, change who you are, or curate yourself as a human being. I, I, I want to shift our focus here to your wonderful character, Jade, right? And, and talk about Jade's secret ingredients here, a recipe for managing feelings. And the first thing I want to say about this book is I want to give you, uh, I want to sincerely say thank you. And here's why. Very early in the book, uh, Jade says, and I'm going to quote here because it's a wonderful quote. When Granny and I bake together, sometimes I start to think of all the steps that I need to complete and get confused along the way. Just do one step at a time, she'll tell me. This way you don't get ahead of yourself and miss the chance to enjoy each moment. The reason why I want to say thank you, and I've talked about this on the podcast before even with other people, Led Bradshaw as well, who's a father who draws uh, comics with his child. They do it together. It's beautiful, wonderful stuff. One of the skills that we work on in my class is this idea of learning how to be comfortable and standing in the middle of chaos and thinking to yourself, okay, let me try to think of a plan and then methodically try to execute that plan as best as I can, one step at a time. And here you are with this book for, for, at, at a very young point, at a very important point in a child's life saying, be in the moment recognize essentially when there is potentially chaos around you and be still and think about the next step. What led you, because that to me, that's a pretty advanced thing to put in such a young person's book. So what led you to focus on this particular aspect of mental health? Because I think we would both agree that this very much falls under a kind of mental health awareness. Absolutely, it does. So I love Jade's Secret Ingredients, partly because um, there's a lot of me in Jade. Um, she was, it was my first book, so it was, you know, me wanting to share so much of my experience. And um, there are a couple of things. So first, um, I am someone who has a background um, that has trauma. And there are many things mental health, mental wellness wise, that I didn't learn until I became an adult. Um, specifically, this stay in the moment, the original uh, title for the first secret ingredient ingredient was mindfulness. Um, I, cre I um, completed my master's of clinical social work at Barry University and our program was uh, trauma informed and mindfulness infused. And when I first got to the program, I was like, Mm, what is this? What are y'all promoting here? <laughs> I was very, very leery about what that meant. But the more I got into it, I realized, oh, it is just the idea of 
not thinking so far ahead, ahead and allowing that to create anxiety for things that have not even happened yet. My brain was so wired to just think, 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 overthink, overthink, and create all these scenarios that then caused my body to respond with the fight, flight, or freeze. And I'm re ready to fight a enemy that did not even exist. So then I was paralyzed. And this is something that I struggled with a lot of my life. And so this very simple idea of staying in the moment, though challenging for some of us, is so beneficial. Because before I start jumping to conclusions about what I think may happen and how I'm gonna respond, and usually my brain is one that would think of all of the bad things that can happen and not the good things that could also happen. And I would get just, I would just be all in my feelings, as I would say, just all over the place. And so I wanted to, with Jade Secret Ingredients, take those clinical master's level concepts that I learned and infuse them in a way that someone like my three-year-old son could say, okay, focus, stay in the moment, focus. Don't let my brain get all of it. Let's just do this right now. Let's just crack our eggs. We still need flour. We still need to do this. We still need sugar. We do, and they're on the counter, and we'll get to them. But right now, we're on number three. Number three says crack six eggs. So we're going to focus on cracking six eggs. And when we finish cracking our eggs, then we will look into sifting our flour. But we're not going to worry about all that right now. We're going to stay here. And when I stay here, not only can I do my task more efficiently, but then I can enjoy it. Because cracking eggs is fun. Whoop, did we get some eggshell in that yolk? Oh, come on. Let's get a spoon. Let's get it out. Scoop it up. But if, I, if I'm so far on step 12 and so worried about, oh, I don't remember how to sift flour. Is the sifter clean? Is it, is it? I can't enjoy cracking my eggs. And so that, that is where um, that first ingredient came from. And um, just taking that, just taking that idea of mindfulness and making it simple. Just stay in the moment. Stay in the moment. Yeah, it speaks to me because I, I have a thing in, in our house, we, we call it, me and my wife, I say, I'm future tired. All that, <laughs> all that means is I'm looking at a future event or something I have to do, and I'm feeling tired for that event in the present, though, <laughs> and how that just doesn't help. It just doesn't. So even, you know, all of us have to have to work constantly on this idea of be in the moment because the moment is fleeting. Quite honestly, it moves on whether you want it to stop or not. It just moves on without you. And uh, so there are there are nine total ingredients that uh, Jade works with and learns from Granny. And I, I won't talk about all of them because I want people to get the book and, and, and have that fun and enjoyment of learning of those ingredients. I do want to talk about one, though, because, again, I can see the thoughtfulness behind why it's there. And if people don't stop and really think about what you're trying to say. And the ingredient I'm talking about here is reflection. If people don't really stop and consider what you're doing here, I think it's easy to miss this little nuanced move that you're making, which is the way you look at reflection in this book. We oftentimes, when we think of reflection and children, we, th we think of it in a negative light. We, ha we have the, the picture in our minds of the child has done something wrong. And the parent says, Go think about what you did. And that's a kind of negative reflection. And there's some merit in that, right? Think about what you did. But what you do in the book that I love is you have a positive or you try to create a positive relationship between reflection and the event and the child so that it's look at what, what we just accomplished together and look at the joy that we had in doing it. And let's reflect on that. That's just something that we don't tend to include in, in a lot of children's books today, which is positive reflection. And if we can get them to connect positivity with reflection early enough, then we get mindful and positively reflecting adults. 
And that's really what we need, is we need that kind of positive relationship with reflection. So again, I, I kind of want to ask you a similar question because I'm interested with your background. I, I Obviously, at this point, I don't have to ask if it was purposeful or not. I know it was now. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> but can I ask you to explore a little bit with us what led you to that ingredient? What were you seeing that you wanted to do it that way? I think um, with reflection and with a lot of things, because so in reflection is number eight um, and then number seven, which is relax. Um, I think sometimes we kind of give a negative connotation to certain things as you spoke about. Um, certain actions. And I think about my own son. So my son is a three-year-old. He is a happy, energetic, busy, creative, kind, loving three-year-old, but he is three. And three-year-olds seem to have a battery that is like the Energizer Bunny. It just keeps going and going and going and going and going. I'm dating myself by saying that. Um, but <laughs> he is always on the move. And sometimes I have to get him, help him to calm down a bit. And in that calming down, I did not want him to feel like it was a punishment because calming down is a part of self-regulation that a emotionally intelligent person is able to recognize where they lie on the feeling spectrum and what they need to do to get to where they want to be. And so if you're trying to um, play with a toy a certain way, if you're all over the place and things like that, you're not gonna be able to do what it is that you would like to do. So we work on taking deep breaths and counting. And it's not, oh, you're in trouble. Go you know, to the corner and count. No, it's a, oh, we're so excited. Come down a little bit so that we can do what we really want to do. And so with reflection, which comes after the relaxed ingredient, I wanted to step back and give Jade a chance to reflect on everything that has happened because she has completed that which she desired to do. She wanted to bake or create something specific and she had did, she did that. And I wanted her to be able to reflect and, and practice doing that not just in a, a correction type of environment, but in an environment that allowed that reflection to be the foundation for the next ingredient, which was be thankful. Because before you're thankful, you have to reflect on what it is that you want to be, that, that you're going to be thankful for. So reflection is always there. It is more how we frame it and how we name it, but you have to reflect first in order to be grateful or to be thankful. There, that's just how it works. You have to think about it. You have to stop and say, oh, man, I had the opportunity to do this. I'm so I'm so happy that happened. I'm so grateful. But that reflection, that is still reflection. And so I think just giving kids an opportunity to practice those skills in a variety of environments and adults to practice them in a variety of environments will help them to stick and be, stick and become more of a um, reflex, if you will, than something that we are using to kind of punish ourselves or others. Yeah, and you mentioned adults as well. And my students are always taken aback when I ask them to reflect on something that they did well. You know, because I, I always tell them it's it's easy to call out the things that you don't like about yourself, about your, your work, that kind of a thing. But you also want to have the confidence to be able to say, hey, you know what? I did a good job here. And so I want to keep building that within me. And, and being confident in that area. So I, I absolutely agree. It, it's very important. Uh, reflection is, is a, a key to, uh, well, it's a, it connects to every aspect of well-being, really, in a lot of ways. I, I want to ask you then to kind of continue with this here as we move toward the, the close of this. What, this is a little bit of reflection for you as well. What, what are your long-term goals here for J.J. Carson Press and for your books my long-term goals are to take my life experiences and share them and share them in a way that others can connect, that they can enjoy, 
and that they can avoid some of the challenges that I went through. Like I said, a lot of these things I learned as a whole grown person and I reflect and I think about it would have been so helpful for me if I knew those items as a younger person. And I don't allow myself to get stuck there into where it becomes depression, where I'm just so upset about what has happened or that it becomes anxiety because I start to project that into my future, but I use it in my present to say, how can I use these things to be a blessing to the generation, to the next generation, my own children, to other children around the world, and also to other people regardless of their age around the world. And so that those are my main goals. And of course I am, um, I created the business so that I can create generational wealth um, for my children in our community and in our family structure as well. So that that is definitely something that is always on my mind and a goal that I am shooting for. Absolutely. Well, I can't recommend these enough. I think these books are absolutely wonderful. And and if someone is looking for children's books that will really challenge children in a way that will help them mature into adulthood, I I I don't know of two other books that I think do a better job of really challenging and yet still maintaining accessibility for children as well. Actually, I'll be putting uh, links to your books and your work in the episode notes, but would you like to just tell our audience where they can learn more about you, about your works and, and, and whatnot? Yes, absolutely. So you can visit our website, which is jjcarsonpress.com, J-J-C-A-R-S-O-N-P-R-E-S-S.com. You can see our books there. You can find um, my bio there, as well as reviews for the books and links to where you can purchase them. You can find them at your favorite bookstore, uh, Target, Amazon, Walmart, Books A Million, Barnes and Nobles, all those wonderful places that carry books, you can find us there. So thank you so much for having me today. This has been a pleasure. It has been refreshing and just so encouraging for me to be able to share my story and my experience with your listeners. So I appreciate you for having me on your platform today. Well, it was my pleasure, Ashley. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Ashley Finley. And remember, what we read to our children is just as important as how much we read. If you enjoyed the episode, use the episode links in the show notes to check out Ashley's works. And consider subscribing to the show and to my social media accounts as well to stay up to date on future conversations. Until next time, Try to keep one foot firmly planted on neutral ground and have a great day.